Microsoft has been working on consolidating its Outlook Mail apps across Windows and the web since 2021, if not before. The march toward the so-called new Outlook seemed to be slow until earlier this month, that is. Microsoft posted an update to its Microsoft 365 Message Center announcing the new Outlook would be considered generally available for commercial customers on August 1st. So, is it panic time yet? given the very unfinished state of the product? And what's going on with its sidekick, Exchange Server SE? So many questions. We might have at least a few answers. Welcome to the Directions on Microsoft Briefing podcast. I'm Mary Jo Foley, the Editor-in-Chief here at Directions. I'm the host for the series of podcasts for those interested in the Microsoft Enterprise IT ecosystem. My guest for today's episode, which will cover what we know, what we don't still know, and what we're starting to piece together about the new Outlook and the next Exchange release, our Directions Analysts, Rob Helm and Jim Gaynor. Rob Helm leads the Analyst team and directs coverage of Microsoft's shifting product roadmap and corporate organization. He's also our lead on Outlook, among other products. Jim Gaynor spearheads our coverage of Windows Server, teams, and other collaboration technologies, as well as enterprise infrastructure. Hello, Rob. Hello, Jim. Thank you Hello. guys so much hey, for Mary doing jo. the podcast. Thank Yay. you. Fun. Thank you for inviting us. That's great. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start out with having you both talk about some of the things we know, or at least think we know, about the new Outlook. And first up, I want to talk about why is Microsoft fixing a product that many do not believe to be broken? Rob? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we don't have five whys, but we have at least two whys. One is the Microsoft <laughs> why, and one is the customer why. <laughs> the, and the customer why, or the Microsoft why, it's about cost control, and it's about control control. So like for cost control, Microsoft is trimming their development costs for Outlook. They should be able to keep new Outlook working at lower cost than the classic Outlook we're all familiar with. Then in particular, the new Outlook app on Windows, it's basically, it's a specialized browser. What does mm -hmm. it browse? Outlook on the web. That's it. The web interface for Microsoft hosted mail, like in Exchange Online. Mm -hmm. So with so with new Outlook, Microsoft can add features to Outlook on the web, and then with just a bit more work, bring those features to the Windows app as well. And they, in general, also the class of developer that you need to work on is different. I mean, classic Outlook, that's scary stuff. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> protocols and database technologies. Um, yeah, that was that was definitely esoteric knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas it's just front end web development with a substantial set of APIs to learn, but still it's a bunch of skills that are quite common. If you're a front end web developer, maybe you're half of the way or a third of the way to being a new Outlook developer. That should be able to give you Microsoft and its partners a large pool of these front end web developers that can come in and extend or keep new Outlook alive. Hmm. And then there's the, the control control thing. Basically, the new Outlook app, it's getting updated, same schedule as the cloud services, which means no schedule at all. When, my, <laughs> when, when Microsoft needs to make a change to the cloud services, you're going to get a change to the cloud services. When Microsoft needs to make a change to new Outlook, you might, if you if you put some uh, canaries or sacrificial animals or whatever you want to call them in the targeted release program for um, Office 365 and Microsoft 365, if you land folks in that, you'll get about 30 days notice before Microsoft makes a change to new Outlook effectively because these people in targeted release will see it roughly 30 days before everyone else does. But in the end, if Microsoft needs to push something out fast it, to new Outlook, whether it's a security fix or just somebody at Microsoft's pet feature, the tenant's going to get it when Microsoft sends it. And that means it can not only get 
fix problems more quickly, but it also can respond more quickly to competitors. Okay. But, you know, there are, I, I said there were two whys, and there are some upsides to this for the customer. So, for example, you know, the new Outlook might have better integration with other applications and and in general better add-ons because the, the new developer API is going to make it possible for more kinds of companies and more kinds of developers to work on extensions that integrate email with other things. And, and, and on the flip side, there are companies who say, nope, email is a dying technology, not going to invest anymore in it, certainly not going to uh, customize an email client. They just want a reliable email service until the day they can shut it off in favor of, I don't know what it'll be, and it'll be then Slack, it might be Teams, it might be it, brain implants, who knows. <laughs> um, if, if new Outlook is really easier to maintain for Microsoft, it's going to be a better endpoint for those customers to get at cloud services that they don't really care about very much. <laughs> I had never thought of it from that angle, but uh huh, <laughs> maybe so, right? Jim, what do you think? So I'm going to build a little bit on on what Rob said. I mean, this is about future direction and portability. We'll call what we'll call classic Outlook. It's a traditional Windows client app. It's got luggage that Microsoft doesn't want anymore. They've got to maintain code bases for Windows. They got to maintain code bases for Mac OS because they've got Outlook for both of those. On Mac OS, that means the old Intel Macs, the newer Apple Silicon Macs. On Windows, that's meant Intel. But now you've got the latest push for Windows on ARM, which means another architecture OS combo. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to add a new feature, if you want to you know, add in Copilot support, for example, that's a lot of code bases to change, no matter how sure. much they've tried to unify them. So comparing to writing for a web app and then wrapping it in, in a in a local application wrapper like Rob described, that's a lot less effort. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you that's what you want. Um, so with all that effort for a native client, you know, who wants to develop to develop all that QA all that who wants to do that if they don't have to. Um, so Outlook's another go at making as much of Outlook independent of the OS and architecture and that helps cost control. Like uh, Rob said, that helps them with portability. But also, and, and here's where we kind of get a little bit, a little bit uh, tinfoil hat. Historically, the Office Suite's been desktop application first. It's been desktop, and they've been working on making web applications. But those have been the second-class citizens. And I think Microsoft would prefer to turn the tables around there. Um, that they'd prefer to have the applications be web first and desktop second. Um, Teams was a first go, really. It never had a native desktop client. It's always been a, a you know, web online service in the first place. This is the first try at doing it with the traditional Office application. And I think Outlook is both the best and worst one to pick. It's the best one to pick because it is all about accessing your email, accessing your calendar, but it's also the worst one because it's so integrated into so many things. Um, but at some point, not now, not with Office 2025, but sometime I'd expect them to kind of try to do the same thing with Word or Excel or PowerPoint. It's a long game, but it has benefits and for the way they'd prefer to deliver services and products if they can make this work with Outlook. I mean, now as a user who likes native apps for my platform of choice, though, I'm not sure it's what I'd prefer, um, but it's definitely something that works better for Microsoft's long-term strategy. I can hear the screams now about the new Excel. I'm getting ready. <laughs> oh, <already. laughs> God. That, that would be the toughest one. I, <laughs> I, I've already had to live through the transition of like the old the old office suite when they went to 2007 and the ribbon and the new rendering engines behind oh, yeah. that. And oh, yeah. no, thank you. <laughs> All right. Here's, here's kind of a loaded question for the both of you. But if you were mm. going to grade the new Outlook, now that we're just a couple weeks ahead of it hitting the GA milestone, what grade would you give it? And do you think it will be enough for, quote, most business users? Jim, can I take a shot at this? Go for it. All you. I, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I once got a grade of Y. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> why? And I asked the school what this was, and they said no basis for grade. <laughs> and that's that's kind of like really honestly what I think new outlook it's great is if you're grading against classic outlook because 
it's just not meant for the same users. It's not really even meant for the same universe. It's kind of this future universe where most of your collaboration is done on proprietary cloud services. Everybody's connected everywhere all the time. And then the big fat intermittently connected apps like Classic Outlook, they just have no place. We're not in that world yet. And so if you grade new Outlook like Classic Outlook, I'd say it's an F now, frankly, Yikes. but it it's, <laughs> keeps creeping along. You just sent me this morning, Mary Jo, a, a pointer to a Microsoft page that shows where new Outlook is relative to Classic Outlook in terms of how a lot of features are implemented or not. And I, I think it'll be up to the C, B minus level by the time it becomes mandatory for Microsoft 365 customers in two to three years. Not a resounding endorsement, but better than an F <laughs> or a Y. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, I, I've, got a, I've got a similar uh, I was probably on double secret probation too. <laughs> So my last semester in college, um, I had to take one a one credit class to fill out to keep my full time student status. So I didn't start paying off my student loans immediately. I needed like give me that one more semester, and I took French, pass and on pass, French 101. And I'd had a lot of time studying Spanish. And if you know French and Spanish look similar written, but pronunciation they're worlds and worlds apart. Mm -hmm. And I struggled and I struggled. And finally, knowing that I was pass and on pass, the teacher took me aside and with all kindness she said just keep showing up just keep showing up and i'll pass you <laughs> just keep showing up <laughs> and sometimes it feels like that i mean if this was pass, new outlook will pass but if it was graded fully on a curve or stack ranked against classic outlook new outlook's way behind there i mean they've, they've got that 80 percent you know they've, they've got that 80 percent you know the pareto pareto principle still stands maybe even 85 or 90 but it's all those edge cases out there i said before decades worth of one-off business right. workflows that are critical to someone and each one's different each one is its own black swan until you've got this massive flock of black swans that's gonna scream if they're forced to take this on immediately and those things aren't there. And frankly, I don't think they're ever going to be there. Mm -hmm. And some of it, again, is that shift in focus from the thing is on my PC to the thing is a cloud service. And, you know, Microsoft would prefer to kill all those black swans because then you don't have to QA for them. It's the control control thing that Rob mentioned again. But yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it as long as it keeps showing up, it'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's, let's delve a little more into what Jim just alluded to, which is there's a lot that's still not there in the new Outlook. Um, so I'm curious what each of you would consider some of the biggest missing features at this point. Can I, can I take a little bit of first shot at this one, Rob? Yeah, please. Okay. So, I mean, two of the big ones that people are still screaming about are PST support and offline support. Um, they're listed as coming soon, but they're still missing. And if you think about it, those are part of that. It's not about your local PC mindset. And I think they kind of went in thinking that, hey, we can kill this off. Like a lot of Microsoft uh, initiatives do, they, they hope that they can kill a thing off and listen for the screams of people who say that they can't have those. Um, it doesn't have delegate support yet, mm -hmm. which is crucial in a lot of offices. I mean, you know, being able to delegate your email, your calendar to somebody, if you're an executive is like that, that's must have stuff. Mm -hmm. Search folders are only partly there. And I don't know about you, but if you're going to have all your, if they want you to keep all of your email, which they want because Copilot will then consume it and give you recommendations based on your email. Um, you want to have it all there. How do you get that stuff in it? You build search folders. They don't really have that. New Outlook still doesn't support connecting to Exchange Server, which is baffling to me. But <laughs> it makes sense in a Microsoft Cloud First kind of way. And I mean, those are all like, you know, to me, those are pretty big things. But there's more that talks about that that big flock of black swans I talked about. And I know that Rob's got a lot more on that one. I don't even want to touch that one. <laughs> I didn't either, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, so a bunch of older extension technologies for Outlook are being killed in new Outlook. And unlike some of these others we've talked about, like Pop, Exchange Server, Microsoft has ruled out bringing back some of these technologies. The big one is COM add-ins. So a lot of third parties, including Microsoft, but also Salesforce and many others, used COM add-ins 
as a, a plug-in technology that allowed them to tie the Outlook client into things like web conferencing systems, CRM, and so on. And now those are all gone. New Outlook is also dropping a bunch of other old extension routes. Um, so, for example, there was something called Visual Studio Tools for Office, which gave rise to something that people sometimes call Office add-ins or Vista add-ins or .NET add-ins. Those are toast as well because they depended on the COM add-in mechanism. And Visual Basic for Applications, VBA. It wasn't never really that heavily that used for Outlook. True story, we did use it very heavily, but <laughs> we're weird. Um, yes. I, so, you know, you're, I, all I can say is if you're going to celebrate the new Outlook general availability date, I guess it's kind of passed already, but if you want to celebrate, crack open a beverage and then start hunting um, for the money and put together plans to find, remove, and replace all your organization's comm edits. Yeah. If I can recommend one to do after this podcast, it's find the comm add-ins and make them go away or determine that you can't, in which case you're on the road to classic for an extended period. Do you think there's any justifiable reason on Microsoft's part to do away with the comm add-ins and Visto and VBA? I've, I've heard them say before, some of these at least, it's due to security, right? But I mean, this is, I think this is gonna break a lot of things, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I, it could be driven partly by security, but I think in the end, it's justifiable if you're Microsoft, um, because for both Microsoft, but also partners and customers, there's a payoff. Mm -hmm. um, getting rid of those add-ins, there's still the JavaScript add-ins, which my Outlook has had for some time, and Microsoft has been pushing, to be fair, for some time, and telling people gently, you know, that comm stuff, it's getting kind of old, and, and you should really be looking at this JavaScript stuff. And it's going to be familiar, this JavaScript add-ins will be, to a whole generation of new de software developers who never once had to sound out the letter C-O-M. <laughs> I mean, old guys like me were nostalgic, but it, it's, it's still, they're, they're, they're everywhere. You know, yeah. I for, before one of the um, talks I was going to give before I recorded it, I popped open my own Outlook and there were six of them in there that I had no idea what. Oh, happened. wow. <laughs> it, it's not, yeah, it's not pretty. No. Okay, so let's let's talk about the timeline a bit because, you know, Rob just gave a recommendation of checking for your com add-ins, but here's, here's the timeline if you're wondering what we know and what we think we know about what's going to happen when. Uh, we know Outlook, the new Outlook goes GA for commercial customers on August 1st. But after that, the Microsoft's not really giving a lot of dates, right? They're just kind of giving um, other milestones that are going to happen. Rob, could you maybe go through some of those so people have at least some idea what to expect after that? Yeah, so what, what my, Microsoft has not given dates, but it has said it's going to retire classic Outlook and replace it with new Outlook for Microsoft 365 and Office 365 apps customers. It will do it in two major phases that there will be a 12 month notification before the start of each of those phases. So if you take that and some other things Microsoft has said and a dartboard and back of the envelope, <laughs> you get, a, if you look in our report about this, we've got at least two scenarios that I think comfortably bracket the right date. It's you've got two to three years from today to get rid of all your comm add-ins if you're going to take new Outlook and stay in the Microsoft 365 subscription uh, route to buying Outlook. Mm. And as far as the timing, I'd take a two to one bet that opt out, the, the, the next phase starts October 1 of next year. But we don't allow gambling in this establishment. <laughs> and I'm shocked, shocked that you would suggest we would. Well, that's, that's why we're here and not in Vegas. Exactly. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take a pause here so that I can talk 
for a minute about another series of podcasts that we've done at Directions on Microsoft. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the ones we've recorded about EAs, also known and loved as enterprise agreements or hated. Um, Directions created a six part podcast series featuring various members of our advisory services team led by Dean Bedwell, all about Microsoft EA negotiation and that process. Before he joined Directions, Dean spent 11 years at Microsoft managing the Canadian business desk where he was responsible for negotiating agreements with Microsoft's largest enterprise and public sector customers. So he definitely knows what he's talking about here. In this series, we discuss everything from project management to discovery, analysis, strategies for getting discounts and concessions, and negotiation levers. Whether you are new to the EA negotiation process or a veteran who wants to hear more about the tips and tricks that we've discovered over the years, you should check out our Microsoft EA negotiation podcasts. Go to directionsonmicrosoft.com slash podcast or directionsonmicrosoft.com slash videos, and you can listen to the entire series for free. You don't have to be a member yet. Um, we've also got a deep dive explainer on the Microsoft EA negotiation process also available for free. You can check it out on our website at directionsonmicrosoft.com. Just go to the resources tab and you can read any and all of our deep dive reports right there. Directions offers advisory services, including EA negotiation support and Microsoft strategy assessments where we help you one on one with your specific Microsoft product questions and licensing issues. For more information, go to directionsonmicrosoft.com or you can email info at directionsonmicrosoft.com and there you can learn about all of our services. Okay, back to the Rob and Jim show. We have not yet broach the subject of Exchange Server SE, which we think is the next and final version of Exchange on-premises. Jim, can you bring our listeners up to speed on where this effort is and whether they should be considering moving to this release once it's out? After all, it's a very tight timeline that they're on. Yeah. You're right. It, it, Deep it's going yeah. it, yeah, yeah. to be a tight timeline. And I'm going to I'm going to say something really quick too. Um, if you're also if you're you listeners if you're also using Skype for Business Server, listen to this because it's the same playbook. The playbook I'm going to describe here is the same playbook they're doing for Skype for Business Server SE. So, exchange the two current versions of Exchange Server that, in, that are in support, 2016 and 2019, both leave support in October of 2025. And that's got a lot of customers, a lot of you listeners, justifiably nervous. But Microsoft's announced plans to release Exchange Server SE subscription edition early in the third quarter of 2025. So that's sometime between July and September, skewing towards July. And that leaves three months or less to move to SE and stay in support. And uh, to quote a favorite movie of mine, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, Microsoft's going to release a final cumulative update for Exchange Server 2019 later this year. And that cumulative update is supposed to pave the road, make it easier to upgrade to SE when it comes out. They claim that SE will be just like a cumulative upgrade from that cumulative upgrade. It'll have the same hardware and OS requirements. They're saying it's going to be pretty much, you know, code compatible, code equivalent. It's not going to, they're not going to really change it a lot other than moving it, you know, any security patches, any stability patches, plus moving it to, you know, the new scheme. That's the promise. You'll just be able to apply a cumulative upgrade. One, if, you, if you're on Exchange Server 2019 with that last cumulative upgrade that comes out later this year, you'll be able to move to Exchange Server SE by basically applying a cumulative update to your existing environment. And that's the promise. And having that upgrade be so low impact is why Microsoft thinks, hopes, customers can deal with such a short window between SE's release and the other versions going out of support. And we'll add in, of course, that you know, with, the, with SE, the support model goes from um, the current, you know, 
mainstream extended to the ongoing support, the ongoing modern support model. Customers are going to have to maintain software assurance on their licenses, thus the subscription edition. That's a whole podcast in its own. I've got a report talking about the SE version of the Skype for Business Server. Rob Helms got one on Skype on Exchange Server. You know, please go check this out. But when it comes to should you move to it, um, if you still need Exchange Server on premises for the foreseeable future, then yes, you should. Full stop. Because Exchange has been a huge security target. We've all seen it in the over in the news over the over recent years. It's been a huge security target. It's been a huge vulnerability. Customers need to be up to date and patched. It may not fix everything. We know that things still happen even if you are patched, but if you aren't patched, things are much more likely to happen to you. So that means that any customer using Exchange Server that's going to need it after October 2025, if you're not on 2019, you need to get on Exchange Server 2019 in the next 12 months. You need to apply that latest cumulative update, and it's that way you're poised to move to SE. But it's still, it's a narrow window to move. Um, it doesn't give a lot of time for internal testing and QA, but the risk is running something that's out of support, not getting security updates. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Nothing, nothing uh, to say against it. I mean, on the client side, yes, hunt down the com add-ins. That's your first priority. Mm -hmm. But on the server, get to Exchange Server 2019. Even if there's nothing compelling in it, the most compelling thing is that that's the only place you can conceivably get to Exchange Server SE in the time that Microsoft is giving you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now let's go back to Outlook. Um, <laughs> let's talk about whether you could envision any scenario where Outlook Classic does not completely disappear and might still be available, maybe for a hefty fee um, for enterprise customers. We already know, because Microsoft has said this, that it will continue to be part of the Office 2024 long-term servicing channel perpetual release. Um, but what about for Microsoft 365 and Office 365 users? Any thoughts there? Yeah, somebody asked me about this a while back, and I rechecked my notes, and Microsoft said, I'm going to quote it, existing installations of classic Outlook for Windows through perpetual licensing will continue to be supported. Doesn't say new installations, doesn't say for free. I expect an extra subscription charge might make Classic Outlook still available with Microsoft 365, but I'm not sure what form it would take. It, it could be a requirement to maintain software assurance. That's how Microsoft is going to make money off of Exchange Server SE. It will require you to pay a subscription-like charge for your perpetual license. Or it could be some kind of a standalone classic Outlook subscription license, a bit like what Teams has ended up as. Mm -hmm. Jim, mm -hmm. do, what are you thinking? <laughs> you seem to have a different view on this. Yeah, I've got a little bit of a different take. I mean, Microsoft's definitely been on a tear to monetize things. That There's no doubt about that. We're mm -hmm. seeing so many products that used to have features built in where those products are now becoming part. Those features are becoming parts of add-ons. There's more levels of add-ons. Monetizing is definitely something on their mind. But if your bet's right, um, you know, they're, they've been giving things pretty lengthy runways. Um, when yeah. it comes to while they've while they've been deprecating a lot of things, we've seen so many announcements of this is getting retired, that is getting retired. When it comes to stuff that's been in release form, you know, if it's been in preview, oh no, they'll kill it within three days. But if it's if it's been released, they've been good about giving pretty lengthy runways. If your bet's right, Rob, then Classic Outlook could be around in opt-out mode until October of 2026. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're not, that's, that's still more than two years out. Mm -hmm. And I lay odds, and I know I'm talking about gambling again. We're not a gambling establishment. <laughs> I'm sorry for the terminology. <laughs> um, but I, I, I really think that Microsoft will do their best not to offer a classic Outlook option at all after them. They'll do their very, very best. And so unless some of those really, really large, really, really key customers scream loud and extended enough, I think they'll try not to offer it at all. Mm. And if they wow. do have something out there, um, Rob, like what you mentioned, like the idea of having some kind of subscription, if you are one of those large customers, be on the lookout for it and consider, you know, 
consider in your next EA negotiation saying, you know, hey, I want to know that I'll be able to continue to use this program for a certain period longer. I mean, you know, there's always things you can you can do in, but I think they're going to try just to kill it. Yeah, uh, I, kept, I keep thinking if they keep it alive, who wouldn't, it, because there's so much outcry against the new outlook, who wouldn't say, okay, then I'm just going to wait, I'm going to pay, I'm going to hold out because I don't want the new outlook. So it's, just, it's a risky yeah. strategy, right? Companies well, you know, I'd I'm, say that, okay. no, go ahead, Jim. Okay, okay, yeah, we're, here we're, we're talking over here. Um, they don't have the budgets right now. IT, IT yeah. operations and infrastructure budgets are strapped right now, True. which means kicking the can down the road as long as you can for any kind of major change that requires investment and moving to new outlook as rob's described in detail requires investment with all those comments you're changing tons of business processes and they'd much rather wait if they could until a time when budgets are a bit looser but okay. this is something that dean and his crew have to take on board regularly you know talk to customers find out what they're doing what microsoft is willing to give and what it demands in return mm -hmm. um and and then they can advise you on what to ask for to, to lay out your own path right that's true i i even had this crazy idea i'm like what if Microsoft says, okay, if you license Exchange Server SC, you can use Outlook Classic, and the people using Exchange Online, you cannot. Is that too far-fetched, too weird? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think the bottom line is Microsoft does not want to encourage customers to go to Exchange Server SE. It knows yeah. it has yeah. some that can't do anything else because of compliance or what have you, but no. It wants all the customers mm -hmm. for Exchange Online it can get its hands on. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree there. I mean, uh, I'll, I even say, and there's another report that I'm working on, Exchange Server SE, Skype for Business Server SE, that is ESUs for Exchange Server. And Skype yeah. For Server. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's really right? what it is. It's ESUs. <laughs> that's, okay. that's what is it, extended security updates? It extended security it. updates, because you know, that's, that's really, you're, you're not going to get much, in, you're not going to get much of anything in terms of new features. Yeah. You're just going to get security updates for that. Yeah. Um, they don't want you using those products, but if you say you have to, they'll take your money. Um, you know, and they're going to leverage this this Outlook thing, you know, like Rob says, to, to try to move you to Exchange Online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's security. It's a hard trade-off, you know. On the one yeah. hand, it, you, having it in your own data center feels more secure. You probably don't have the armies of secure, trained security people that someone like Microsoft does. Yeah. But on the other hand, you don't have the real army of some country trying to break into your exchange. <laughs> you're, so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's that's the thing with with. The larger thing in general with cloud is, you know, and moving their services online is yes, Microsoft has many times more resources than any other customer does to maintain the infrastructure and the security. However, they are also a much bigger target. Okay. All right. Last question. Um, we talk among ourselves at Directions a lot about Microsoft being under increasing pressure to monetize its products maybe at least in part to offset all of its AI infrastructure spending. So how does that kind of pressure internally at Microsoft potentially play into what happens from a strategy and a license, licensing and pricing perspective with Outlook and Exchange, if you think it does? Well, I, I guess I don't see it so much as pressure from AI security or anything else. I just think that the company has made a business decision to earn more from legacy products like mm -hmm. Classic Outlook and Exchange Server SE. I, I, I think a little bit of what's happening with Broadcom and VMware, the screams of which have penetrated our ears here at Directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, customers who keep those products should expect some features to break because Microsoft is just going to drop features to cut its own development costs as it's doing with new Outlook. Mm -hmm. And subscription license costs for those products will go up Every time you resign your enterprise agreement, I guarantee you there will be at least one thing, a new requirement or a higher price or something else that's going to bump up your subscription license costs. And gradually perpetual licenses will just die. Hmm. So, you know, Dean and his EA advisory team and their customers, they've got some tricky negotiations ahead to navigate this. Yeah, there's, you know, the, the thing I mentioned, you know, with 
these SE versions of Exchange and Skype server. They're really just ESUs under different guys. Microsoft found, starting with Windows 7 ESUs, that offering minimal levels of support on an otherwise defunct product is a revenue generator. And I think that's what you're going to see for for the legacy products out there. They're, they'll, they'll, if they do keep them going, it'll be as a, as a revenue generator. They want to move you to subscriptions. Like Rob said, those subscriptions are going to go up a little bit each time. And if the current trend continues, the trend we've been seeing over the past 18, 24 months is that rather than those products getting new features, exciting new features to help draw in new customers, they're still they're going to add features to add-ins that will continue to increase their average revenue per user. Mm-hmm. ARPU. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be so much more important because let's face it, there are no new customers for email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you both. That was a really fun episode. I appreciate <laughs> you both being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. And- Thank you. And to close, I'd like to remind our listeners they can find lots more coverage of all things Microsoft related on directionsonmicrosoft.com. Thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, comments, or any topics that you would like to hear our directions analysts cover in one of these podcasts, please do not hesitate to contact me via Twitter or X at Mary Jo Foley. And speaking of Twitter, give us a follow at Directions MSFT for all the latest Microsoft Enterprise product and licensing information. Thanks again. 